In this video lecture, we're going to talk about thermal resistances in parallel, contact resistance, and R values. In our last couple of lectures, we've talked about thermal resistances in series, and we've shown this thermal circuit and come up with nice methods for how to quantify the flow of heat when it has to go through multiple layers. Well, thermal resistance can also happen in parallel. You can have heat transfer going through different media in parallel. So for example, here we have a, a plane wall, also a composite wall, where heat may be going through the wall through one type of material A and then separately through another type of material B. So here you'd have heat flow in parallel through each of these two different sections of wall. So if we could make the assumption, and this assumption might be a little bit of a stretch, but if we could make the assumption that the surface temperatures at wall A and B were the same and characterized by TS1, and also that the temperatures on the other side were the same, then we could quantify the total thermal resistance going through this wall like this. If you remember, when thermal resistances are in series, you just add up all the thermal resistances. Well, when they are in parallel, to get the total thermal resistance, you take this, you use this relationship. The inverse of the total thermal resistance is equal to the inverse of the resistance through wall section A plus the inverse uh, through wall section B. So you'd have to add each of those up and then take the inverse of that to get the total thermal resistance. If you recall, for a conductive thermal resistance, we have the relationship that R conductive is equal to L, which is the thickness of the wall, divided by K, which is its thermal conductivity, and then A, which would be the area normal to the flow of heat transfer, the surface area of the wall normal to the flow of heat transfer. So specifically, because we have these two different materials, we've given wall section A, the subscript A, and wall section B, the subscript B. So if we wanted to get the total thermal resistance for heat flow through this wall, we could use a relationship like this. And then, the, of course, to calculate the total flow of heat, we would use the temperature difference, TS1 minus TS2, divided by that total thermal resistance. So you can also have resistances happening in series and in parallel at the same time. So let's look at an example of that. And this is actually a much more realistic scenario. So let's say rather than assuming this temperature and this temperature to be the same, a better assumption might be that there that we're going to consider convection happening where on this side of the wall we'd have air or some kind of fluid and that fluid circulates really well so we can assume it all to be at a uniform temperature so it's going to be heat is going to be convecting from this uniform temperature up to here to each of those wall surfaces then in parallel through the wall and then we're also going to assume that it's going to be convecting back out to this air or fluid on the other side of that wall so what we would see here is that we have heat transfer happening in series through wall section A. So first, heat would need to convect from air to get to surface A. Then it would have to conduct through that wall A, and then it would have to convect back out again. So here we'd have the convective thermal resistance plus the conductive thermal resistance plus the convective thermal resistance on the other side. Similarly, we'd have this, the same thing through wall B. We'd have a convective thermal resistance, and then we'd have conduction through wall B, and then we'd have convection from the surface of from the the surface on the right hand side into the right the air on the right hand side. So here we'd have heat transfer going in series through wall A, convection, conduction, and then convection again, and a parallel track through wall B, but we'd have series thermal resistances, convection, conduction, and then convection as you go through wall B. So how do we quantify something as complex as this? So again, we would look at, we would take this inverse relationship to get the total thermal resistance. So first we'd have to add up all these resistances in series to get RA and RB, and then we'd use the inverse relationship to get R total. So that would look something more like this. And to calculate the total flow of heat, we'd get, we'd be going in our thermal circuit, we'd be going all the way from 
the air temperature on the left hand side all the way to the air temperature on the right hand side. So if you recall, we represented temperatures in a thermal circuit using a node. So here is the node for T infinity 1. So this node represents that temperature. So from here, however, the heat would split and follow two parallel tracks. So this would rep this resistance would represent the convection. This would be 1 over H1 times AA, the convective thermal resistance uh, from here to here. We would then have this other node representing this temperature. Let's call this TS1 comma A. We would have conduction through wall section A, which would be represented by the thermal resistance L over Ka times Aa. And I'll try to be consistent and use capital A's for these subscripts. Finally, we'd have TS2A, which would be this temperature. And we'd have convection from here to here, which would be represented by 1 over H2 times Aa. And finally, that would go back to T infinity 2. And similarly, on the B side, we'd have the convective. I'll skip writing these. Then we'd have TS1 comma B. We'd have the conductive thermal resistance through wall B. Then we'd have TS2 B. So this is how our thermal circuit would look. We'd have this series parallel configuration where through each wall section we'd have a series configuration and then to combine the two and consider them in parallel we'd need to use this relationship but only after we've calculated each of the individual resistances in series. Okay, so another way of doing this would be to consider just consider this to be two separate systems. So we could just think of heat going through here. Let's call this QA. And heat going through here. Let's call this QB. So we could just assume that these are two separate and independent systems. And we could calculate the thermal resistance for A and for B separately. And then we could um, calculate QA. So QA would just be T infinity 1 minus T infinity 2 as our driving force divided by RA, where RA considers each of these three thermal resistances in series. And then we could do the same thing for B. So we're just um, calculating these two each separately, and then we could just calculate the total flow of heat by adding those two together. So a different way to express this mathematically, um, but you would end up with the same result, and you could go back and verify that if you'd like to. Sometimes it's not quite as obvious. So I mentioned here we have, uh, if we were to consider this happening, this heat transfer happening in parallel, well, it's you can. It's a pretty good assumption that this air circulates well. I guess if that is the case, but in most, if this is a room or an oven, this would be a decent assumption that the air in there is circulating well, and you could treat that as a uniform temperature, and then have that split off. Uh, whereas it may not be as great of an assumption if we were to ignore convection, it may not be as great of an assumption to assume that these two temperatures are the same. And this just depends on your system. Um, so there are different ways of looking at this. So if we looked at a conduction system where we have heat conducting through these two different walls, here you can see uh, we have wall E, F, G, and H. So we may have heat flowing through here and through here, but how well does that heat travel this way? So there are a couple of different ways of looking at this particular circuit. And note that here we're only considering conduction. There's no, we're not thinking about convection on the left or the right. We're just thinking about conduction from this surface to this surface. So there are a couple of different ways of writing out this thermal circuit. So this particular way, we are, in this particular case, we are assuming that the temperature at this interface and the temperature at this interface are the same. And similarly, we're considering that the temperature at this interface and this interface are the same. So you'd have to use your engineering intuition to see if that's a good assumption or not.
So this case A assumption assumes that surfaces normal to the x direction are isothermal. And just like I said, we're assuming that if you go, here's the x direction, so normal to the x direction, we're assuming that it's isothermal here. So whether we're looking here, here, or more accurately at these two surfaces, we're assuming that those are the same temperature. Then that flow of heat splits into these two parallel resistances. So the other assumption we could make would be that um, similar, well, we could assume that uh, that these are two isolated systems and we have a separate flow of heat here and a separate flow of heat here. And this looks like the thermal circuit that we just looked at, um, where we'd assume that this temperature is the same either way, but then the flow of heat splits between these two separate paths. So basically we'd be assuming that the surfaces parallel to the x direction are adiabatic. And just to explain that a little bit better, again, here's the x direction. So if we're going parallel to the x direction and looking at these surfaces, we're assuming that heat doesn't cross over this boundary and we can consider those as two separate systems. So if that's the case, then we would look at these three resistances all in series and we would not sum them up in parallel until we have added all three of these in series. So we could also uh, just totally treat these as two separate things. We could have Q1 going through the top and Q2 going through the bottom and we could just calculate Q1 and then separately calculate Q2 and then just add them up to get the total amount of heat. So these are there are a couple of different ways of thinking about it and you really just have to use your engineering intuition and maybe some sanity checks to figure out what's the best way. If Or you could potentially evaluate it both ways and if you evaluate it these two separate ways well then these two separate ways of calculating it would actually bracket the real solution so you'd expect the real solution to be somewhere in between those two different answers that you've got and you would in fact get two different answers so there are some assumptions here one of the biggest assumptions we have made is that heat flow is still one dimensional and if you've been thinking about this clearly it would not be one dimensional we'd be making a one dimensional approximation of what is very clear a two-dimensional system so you're certainly going to have corner and edge effects that you would and you'd have flow of heat going uh, up or down at any point or at, at angle so a really thorough and rigorous analysis might involve solving the actual heat equation in two dimensions for each separate solid which would be much much more complicated than taking this one-dimensional approximation and using a thermal circuit Okay, there is another another concept when we're talking about thermal resistances called contact resistance. So we've shown when we have these composite walls and we have the two walls adjoining, well, sometimes those two walls may not be in perfect contact with each other. So if you zoomed in on this section and looked at it here, you may see that at some places there's really good solid-to-solid -solid contact, so you'd get really nice conduction happening. Whereas in other places you might have uh, fluid gaps in the solid and so you might get flux in those particular isolated locations being not as good but if you looked at this on aggregate what you might see is that there may be a big drop a big delta t in your temperature profile so um, that's what we're looking at here if we superimpose a plot of temperature over this drawing with temperature on the y-axis and x on the x-axis, you may see this sudden drop in temperature across that gap. Um, and this is just called a contact resistance. So obviously this is actually quite a complex thing and there would be a lot going on here on the microscopic scale. But on a macro scale, you could measure this experimentally and uh, or look in tables and just find what the contact resistance may be. You may just be able to measure that and just treat it as a contact resistance. So the contact resistance, we are going to introduce a new, some new nomenclature. So if you recall, when we look at flow of heat, we use Q. When we look at flux, we use Q double prime, where the flux is basically the heat transfer per unit area. We use a similar nomenclature for thermal resistances, when we're talking about thermal resistances, and it's not per unit area, so we'll just call that four unit area. So when we're using the four unit area version of, of thermal resistance, we'll use these double prime, but, and this is how this would be defined. It's basically when you have a gap like that, 
um, how much does your temperature drop with at a measured flux. So let's look at this again. Here's another composite wall. So here we have here we have our temperature profile going through that solid, and then if we have contact resistance, we'll see this big delta T jump in temperature, and we'd see again a nice continuous straight line um, in terms of temperature as we go through material B. So there are different forms. I just want to review these different forms when we're using the flux form or just the flow of heat form of resistance. So if we wanted to quantify total heat flowing through these two solids and the contact resistance in between, our Q would be TS1 minus TS4 um, divided by the total thermal resistance. So we would write that total thermal resistance like this. We'd have the conductive resistance through material A. We would then have the contact resistance, which may just be given to us as a constant, or we could look this up for particular materials, or we could measure this experimentally. So we would take this, um, this contact resistance for unit area and divide it by the area. Notice how I'm not saying per unit area, because per unit, per unit area would imply that you would multiply it by the area, but here we divide it by the area. And then we would have the conductive thermal resistance through material B. Notice that this total thermal resistance is going to have units of Kelvin per watt. So if we looked at this and we multiplied our whole system through um, by A, or divided it through by A when we're calculating heat flow, we would, so if we, well, let's see here. If we divided the system by A, we would get that our flux is equal to TS1 minus TS4 divided by the total thermal resistance for unit area. And then our resistance looks differently too. We've multiplied our resistance through by A. And notice this has units of meters squared Kelvin per watt. These are the inverse units that you might expect for a heat transfer coefficient. Um, and so those thermal resistances would be the conductive thermal resistance, the contact resistance, and the conductive resistance through material B. So if you notice, this is just, it's just totally analogous. It's just two different ways of writing this when you have a plain wall system. You could look at just one, one meter squared of the system and express things in terms of this uh, thermal resistance for unit area. We're not considering convection in this particular system, but if we were thinking about convection, as we've covered before, a convective thermal resistance would be written like this, 1 over H times A, and in four unit area form we would have just 1 over H, and it would indeed have inverse units to H, so meter squared Kelvin per watt. So just a little bit funky, it's hard to get used to this, but this can be a handy tool. These thermal resistances are certainly a good tool to use. And actually, if you've done any construction work or building energy analysis, you'll actually see that this is a fairly ubiquitous uh, term when we're talking about insulation. So there's something called an R value. So insulation is given an R value, which is going to be analogous to... Uh, to this guy really. I, I, the R value would be based on the thickness of the insulation and the thermal conductivity, the effective thermal conductivity of that insulation material. And it would be assigned an R value, and as you can see these are recommendations, this is from Home Depot's website, how much insulation you need based on which zone you're in. And you can see this is a insulation with a really nice and high R value. Just reading about this a little bit more from the United States Department of Energy, they say an insulating material's resistance to conductive heat flow is measured or rated in terms of its thermal resistance or R value. The higher the R value, the greater the insulating effectiveness. So the R value depends on the type of insulation, its, thick, its thickness, and its density. So the density would affect K, the thickness would affect L, and certainly the type of insulation would affect K. So this is a term that uh, isn't just theoretical. This is used very commonly in the building industry. In the second paragraph, it says installing more insulation in your home increases the R value and the resistance to heat flow. In general, increased insulation thickness will proportionally increase the R value. So more, th more thickness, you're increasing the R value because you are adding L to the equation. Whereas if you wanted to 
um, add insulative value by changing thermal conductivity, well then, because the R it was equal to L over K, to increase R, you'd want to decrease the thermal conductivity. So uh, that concludes our lesson on thermal resistances in parallel and also uh, contact resistance. Thank you.